All right, so so Sydney, um, as we jump into these uh to these uh, core political issues that uh you know that at least the media tries to tell us anyway, this is what the black community cares about. You know, this is what the evangelicals care about. Those kind of things. You know, leading into that, um, the actual process of of the vote because we've been talking about how you know how you can follow the money trail a lot to figure out who's with who. That's always um, your best bet. Right. Follow the money. And, and so let me just ask your your stance on. Um, one, the Electoral College and the fact um, uh, that money has to be raised to even be considered you know, for the federal election. That's right. And so one of the core uh, uh, items in our platform when it comes to electoral politics is uh, public financing of campaigns. Mm -hmm. And uh, a big issue for us this time around is actually giving the American people an opportunity to hear the full range of options. As you pointed out, most people uh, aren't aware that there are other options, and it's because you look at the debates, and who's in the debates? The Democrat and the Republican, right? And they set a very unrealistic bar of making 15% in, in uh, uh, popular polling before they'll allow another candidate in. And it's very simple why that is. You know, the Democrats and the Republicans together run this election commission. It's their baby. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who get to call the shots. So, of course, they do it to benefit themselves. Mm -hmm. The actual uh, uh, criterion ought to be a very simple one. Is a candidate on the ballot in enough states to win the Electoral College? If they are, because that's how you become president, right? Mm -hmm. You win the Electoral College. If they are, they ought to be in the debates. And right now, there are four people who qualify. Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Gary Johnson of the Libertarian Party, mm -hmm. and Jill Stein of the Green Party. There ought to be those four candidates up in front of the American people explaining what they think ought to be the right uh, way forward for this country. Mm -hmm. So to make that happen, then, um, do you think that it's mainly a grassroots effort, or do you feel like that, uh, that the bottom line is uh, getting more funding, getting more support? One of our core values, and in fact, we, we, ha we, we uh, express what the Green Party is about in two ways. One is in what we call the four pillars, uh, and another one is what's called the 10 key values. Now, the Green Party actually is a global movement. So there's Green Parties in Europe. There's a Green mm -hmm. Party in Australia. Um, a Green president was just elected in Austria. Um, and uh, so it's it's a global thing, and, and the four pillars really comes out of the European Green Party, and it's social justice and uh, ecological wisdom, nonviolence, and grassroots democracy. And grassroots democracy is one of the most important principles for us mm -hmm. because we don't think that it's right that uh, – uh, the heirs to Walmart's fortune, right? That mm -hmm. that the big bankers who who are making money out of predatory lending should have a megaphone in politics while the rest of us are silenced. Mm -hmm. That's not the way democracy should work. In fact, that doesn't even make sense when you think about what democracy is. So public financing of campaigns, getting rid of Citizens United, getting big corporate and big union money out of the electoral process and making sure that the people's airwaves are used to really allow them to become informed and educated about the issues that affect their lives mm -hmm. and what the candidates they have the opportunity to vote for are going to do about those issues. That's how we get it done. Yeah. Now, you realize that uh, that gets called you know, uh, not democracy, that's actually socialism, communism. Is that something that you embrace as a party? or uh, No. Or uh, no. uh, what's the rebuttal to, to when people throw out those, you know, those Well, terms? first of all, there's a, the public financing of campaigns has nothing to do with socialism or communism, mm -hmm. right? Um, saying that rich people shouldn't run things doesn't make you a communist or a socialist. It just makes you a, a, dem a small D Democrat, right? Mm -hmm. Jeffersonian democracy. Mm -hmm. Socialism and communism are words that are much misused. So let me just very briefly. Socialism is an economic theory. And it says that people who are engaged in a productive enterprise, building things in a factory, working in a radio station, whatever it might be, the, the people who are actually doing that should be vested with ownership in that enterprise. They should be people who also own it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's socialism, the economic theory. Communism is the political theory that says that we should plan our economy and plan our political structure so as to force that to happen. The Green Party doesn't uh, embrace communism at all, and the reason is because communism inevitably becomes a way of controlling people. It it, it turns into totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. It's not that they, it, you know, it's it's a nice theory, and in, 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 in when you when you listen to it, you know, from everyone according to their ability to everyone according to their need, sounds like paradise. But the fact is, uh, human economy and human human affairs are simply too complex to be reduced to some stick figure game where you can decide right. what everybody gets. Mm -hmm. And when you try to reduce it to that, the 
well, the inevitable result is is a mess, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, now, as for socialist economic ideology, some of that is something that we support. We support worker ownership. We support democracy in the workplace. That's not to say that we're communists or that we think that you know that people shouldn't be able to own their their businesses or or decide for themselves what they want to do with their lives. Mm-hmm. It just says that democracy ought to be as an important a value in the economic sphere as it is in the political sphere because people should be in control of their own lives. Mm-hmm. Right? That's what freedom and liberty are. Um, we do have, and, and, and this is a big conversation going on in the Green Party right now, we are finally coming around to uh, rejecting um, big C capitalism. And, uh, and, and there's a reason for that. Capitalism is, uh, as it's been practiced since the 14th century when it was created in Europe, capitalism is predicated on exploiting resources to cause... Uh, a growth in monetized value. Mm -hmm. So it's predicated on continual growth and it's predicated on exploitation of resources. And there are two very, very important problems here. One is we don't live on an infinite planet. We live on a finite planet. Mm -hmm. And and when you have a a finite situation and you introduce unlimited growth, we have a word for that. We call it cancer. It kills the host, right? And the other problem is when you're exploiting resources, Well, what happens when you run out of resources? And we are running out of resources. We are up against a crisis of consumption that is destroying the planet. You know, our wildlife has declined. Our ecological foundation for human civilization has declined by 50% in our lifetimes. That's a huge crisis. I mean, that's that's an extinction-level event if it continues. We can't keep doing that. So we've got to move away from that kind of capitalist ideology toward a new economy based on one of our four pillars, which is ecological wisdom. How do we build an economy that is sustainable, that Mm -hmm. is a steady state economy that allows us to build the kind of world we want to live in and then pass it along to our children and they can pass it to theirs and they can pass it to theirs in perpetuity. That's our responsibility as human beings. And and Now, with those ideals, have you seen any clash when it it comes to the uh, religious front? You know, um, do you... Um, are you embraced by any of the uh, denominations, or how, how does that part work? Be, you know, so, be, because a lot of times you'll 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 uh, see that conflict, which personally I don't see it as a conflict, but some kind of put science versus religion. So. We have a very diverse party uh, in many respects, um, and one of our ten key values is respect for diversity, and that doesn't just mean racial diversity or economic diversity. That also means cultural and religious diversity. Mm-hmm. So we have within the Green Party atheists, Christians, Muslims, uh, Jews. Jill Stein is Jewish. I'm a Catholic. Mm-hmm. Um, I have many atheist friends in the party. We really value bringing together all faith traditions and all belief systems and having them hash out together uh, what it is that we hold in common in value and really promoting that and really holding on to that. Okay. So, um, no, there's no conflict. And as for as for religion versus scientists, as I said, I'm a Catholic. I'm also a Ph.D. mathematician. I'm okay. trained in the sciences, and I find no contradiction whatsoever. Good, so, good. yeah, I'm fine. Good. All right, so, uh, so we've been treading a little bit, but how, how about we go ahead and into the deep end? Yeah, <laughs> you bet. <laughs> so, um, first one I'm going to say, since it starts with the A, abortion. When that word comes up in a uh, Green Party debate, uh, what's the stance? So the Green Party is uh, a pro-choice party. Uh, And as you can imagine, for those of us in the party who are Catholic, um, we have some issues because I uh, consent to the teaching of my church, something that you can only know through faith, Mm -hmm. which is that an unborn child is still a human being. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's interesting, though. The question here is really by people who are on either side of this issue, they really talk about different questions. People on the pro-life side are talking about the value and sacredness of human life, which is an important thing to talk about. People on the pro-choice side are talking about what actually happens in society when we structure laws around this issue, and what about a woman's sovereignty over her own body? Mm -hmm. Um, Now, I'll tell you a very personal story that really sorted this out for me. when I was a much younger man and my wife and I wanted to have a child uh, and she got pregnant, so this was entirely on purpose. Mm-hmm. And I forget how many months pregnant she was, but I was probably in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 weeks. And she started to bleed and we went to the doctor and the doctor said, this fetus isn't developing properly. Mm-hmm. Um, it is going to abort. Um, and here are your choices. You can wait for it to happen or we can take care of it right now. If you wait for it to happen, 
there's a risk that you could be in trouble. You mm -hmm. could suddenly start bleeding. You could be damaged in a way that might make it difficult to have more children. There was no question of, you know, are we going to have this child or not have this child? We weren't going to have that child. That was the medical fact. Mm -hmm. The question was, what do we do about it? And in the event, uh, she had a DNC. Um, but that's what an abortion is, mm -hmm. you know, dilation and, and I forget what, a cutilage or something. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we got pregnant again, and my son has uh, just got accepted to Fordham University Law School. Yeah. So it's a happy awesome. ending, right? Awesome. Now here's the thing. Do I want the government in that waiting room with me and my wife, mm -hmm. second-guessing what that doctor is telling us, and threatening anybody in that room with jail if they make the wrong decision? Or is this really not an appropriate place for the government to be? Right. I value human life, and I value unborn human life. But the question for me is, what is the correct role of government? Mm -hmm. And interestingly, in those places where women have the full range of, reproduct cho of reproductive choices available to them, and including all the health care and child support and prenatal and postnatal and everything they need, um, the number of abortions goes down and the number of unwanted pregnancies goes down. Hmm. And if we value human life, that's, that's the outcome we're looking for, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So that's, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the Green Party, and I think the Green Party has taken the right position on this, that okay. we need to keep the government out of that medical waiting room and give women sovereignty over their own bodies. It's a moral choice, but it's one they're going to have to make. All right, all right. So next, let me ask you about, um, I try to blanket it by saying social services. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, where is that uh, stance when it comes to pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps? Or if you need help, there should be tax money for whatever the social service, you know, whether you say it is welfare or what have you. So the Green Party platform, uh, very briefly, is first of all that we should get rid of unemployment offices and replace them with employment offices. Mm. There shouldn't be any such thing as somebody who wants to work and can't because there isn't anything available for them. Mm. There is so much that needs to be done in our country. We need to rebuild roads. We need to rebuild our energy infrastructure. We need to get away from fossil fuels and go to renewables. Mm. Jill Stein calls it a Green New Deal. Mm. And what it means is putting 20 million people to work getting us off fossil fuels by 2030 to put a halt to climate change and to put this country back on the track to being a, uh, a positive, developed, clean, uh, uh, economically dynamic country like it used to be. Okay. Um, we also believe strongly that our social contract ought to include everyone. And one of the unfortunate features of traditional capitalism is it requires that part of the workforce be idled. It requires unemployment in order to function because if nobody's unemployed, if everybody's happy with their job, then you can no longer exploit labor. Mm -hmm. And capitalism requires you to be able to exploit labor in that way. Okay. So part of moving away from that kind of a structure is saying the social contract needs to include everyone. Nobody should worry about where their next meal is coming from, whether they got a roof over their head, what they're going to do if they get sick, how they're going to get educated. So some specifics, a guaranteed basic income. And this is something that people have been talking about all over the world. It's being tried in some places. It's not a new idea. It's been around a long time. Nixon even toyed with it in the early 70s. It was, mm -hmm. it was, at, those, at that time, it was called a negative income tax. Okay. Right? It would replace all these means-tested things like food stamps and so on, um, where the government gets into your lives and say, do you really need this? Do you really deserve this? The fact of the matter is just being a human being in this society means you deserve to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. So everybody would get the same. And we'd do away with all that stuff that, that stigmatizes people because they haven't uh, somehow achieved the American dream. Um, of course, uh, free education, K through college. We already have K through 12. There's no reason we can't have K through college. Um, and getting rid of student mm -hmm. debt. If we can spend a hundred, you know, one and a half trillion dollars on a stupid jet we don't need that doesn't work, yeah. we can spend that money on 20 years of free college for everybody and eliminating all student debt. Use quantitative easing, just like we got the big banks out of trouble over their mortgage bubble that they created. We can do exactly the same thing over the student debt bubble that they also created, mm -hmm. just quantitative easing and get rid of it right now. Okay. That would provide a stimulus to the demand side of the economy and give a whole generation of young people an opportunity to participate in the economy, which right now they're all carrying around this big ball and chain mm -hmm. that's stopping them from progressing in their lives. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the particulars, but you get the idea. Yeah, yeah. And I, I definitely want to bookmark the, uh, the the energy I heard you mention, uh, some, some of that. Uh, but yeah, and you answered the question before I got to it about the education, so it's pretty mm -hmm. clear where, where the stance is. Mm -hmm. um, but now, 
the two kind of play together. Um, because what would you say about those who say, you know, uh, that is one welfare versus the others, either corporate welfare or social welfare, and you know, and to provide, I, I guess, for the education piece is. Um, is education a, a right? Is that is that what I'm hearing? Education, all people is a right. Is that why that's the state? Well, so let me so let me address those two things in order. Let me come back to the education as a right. Uh, uh, corporate welfare versus social welfare. You know, since since the first Clinton presidency back in the 90s, um, we've had a whole lot of one and not much of the other, mm. right? Our, our social welfare is minuscule compared to most developed countries, and we give away hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars to the big corporations, to the ADMs and car. Cargills and Exxon Mobils, and especially to the defense industry. I mean, that's a trillion dollar giveaway every year to build weapons we don't need. Um, so, yeah, we need to get rid of the corporate welfare mm. and start taking care of people, right? Okay. I mean, that's that's what our government should be doing. It's supposed to be our government. It should be taking care of us mm -hmm. and not Lockheed Martin, yeah, right? Um, now, uh, the other issue, uh, education as a right. Um, you know, clear back in the 1780s, Thomas Jefferson introduced a bill called the Dissemination of Knowledge Bill. Um, back at that time, there was no such thing as public education, and it was his effort to get it started. And his reasoning was this. The idea of democracy is that we should govern ourselves. That's a good idea. I think we all agree on that. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're going to govern, govern yourself well, if society is going to govern itself well, then it needs a populace that understands the issues. It right, needs right. a populace that knows what's going on. In other words, education, from my point of view, isn't so much a question of, you know, do you have a right to it? My question is, how could we ever possibly think we could do without it and still have a democracy? Mm. Because how do people govern themselves if they're ignorant? You have to have an education in order to be able to make sound decisions for yourself, for your community, for your family. Um, and in our world, it, you know, it, back when public education first started, it was pretty much through eighth grade. Then it was through 12th grade. Well, let's face it, the world has progressed to a point where in order for you to have a complete education, as much as, as a person probably really wants, um, we need to be providing that opportunity right up through a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, let's have the Green Party stance on guns, for instance. Um, the Green Party uh, is not opposed to the Second Amendment, and in fact, I'm a gun owner. Um, both purchased myself and inherited from family. Mm -hmm. um, however, the Green Party recognizes that uh, guns at this point in our history are a terrible scourge. Uh, the Second Amendment has been interpreted in such a way as to be, well, we all ought to be armed to the teeth and protecting ourselves from one another, and that's not the way to run a healthy society. Um, gun owners ought to be held to account uh, as being people who are properly trained, um, guns should be properly registered. There, of course, should be background checks. We should close all those loopholes. Um, we need to treat gun ownership with the same kind of common sense approach we, uh, that we treat car ownership. I mean, I can't get in a car and just go tooling off down the road until I've taken the lessons and passed the test and got a license and obey the laws. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why shouldn't anything else be the same way? So, so let me ask you about military-grade uh, rifles. Uh, do civilians have the right to those as well? <sighs> We don't have a platform issue that speaks to that directly. Um, and I see, now I'm speaking personally, and I'm okay. not speaking on behalf of the Green Party. Um, I see two competing principles that I think have to be balanced against one another. Um, I don't think it's right to have a militarized police force and a defenseless civil uh, community. Mm. I don't think that's healthy. So if our police are going to be running around in tanks and carrying M16s mm -hmm. and using all kinds of high-tech crowd control surveillance methods, um, then the people need to be in a position to stand up to the police because sometimes that's what we have to do in a democracy. We have to stand up and say, no, we're not going to accept this situation and peacefully demand change. Yeah. And we need to be able to do that. That's one principle. Mm -hmm. The other principle, of course, is Good heavens, what do I need an assault rifle for? I mean, come on. You know, let's, let's not have everybody running around armed to the teeth as though this were some kind of bad TV show. We should have a peaceful, trusting society where I feel like I can walk out onto the street, where you feel like you can walk into a store or drive down the road and not worry that some Yahoo is going to escalate a situation to where people start getting killed. We don't need that, and we shouldn't have it. 
So I think that your response just now kind of begs the next question of mm. what's the Green Party's response as far as what's what's happening in the um, recent events and news as far as police brutality and things like we that. We take a very strong stance. We're very strong supporters of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we call for uh, a number of steps to put an end to this. Um, we really need to see an end to the police brutality. So number one, um, the police departments have to be held accountable, and we cannot expect them to hold themselves to account, nor can we expect prosecutors in those communities to hold them to account, because the police and the prosecutors are part of the same justice system. They cannot hold a check on one another. So in any case where someone dies in police custody or there's a question about the use of police violence, there should be an independent investigation and depending upon what the investigation reveals, an independent prosecution to ensure that the police departments are held to account. Um, what's been happening to people of color throughout our history is continues to be a national scandal, and the fact that this is still happening, that uh, as we saw just a week or two ago, that a, a black man can be lying down his back in the street with his arms in the air saying, I don't have a gun, don't shoot me, mm -hmm. and he gets shot. Right. I mean, it's just, we can't, it's, it, it's beyond... Uh, anything that anybody should be willing to tolerate. So, uh, so that's a, a first step. Of course, demilitarizing the police. You know, back when I was a kid, police were just part of the community. Yeah. Right. I mean, they were us, and we were them, and that's how it's supposed to be. But with the militarization of the police that's been going on the last several decades, the attitude in the police department is it's us and them. That they are a military, and we're the thing being, uh, you know, we're the enemy. And uh, uh, that's absolutely wrong-headed way to run a society. Um, police need to be embedded in their communities. They should be armed minimally, um, and uh, and they should not ever have this kind of militarized, panic-stricken. I mean, we're in a we're in a in a situation now where uh, where police are allowed to panic and start firing, and and civilians are required to hold their cool when they've got a gun in their face. Right, and it's supposed to be the other way around. They're supposed to be the professionals, right? They're the ones who are supposed to be able to establish calm and do things safely. And as we see in other parts of the world, that's how it works, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, this kind of thing happens in Europe, and people don't get shot; they get arrested and and uh, and very often taken to the hospital because usually they're nuts, right? Yeah. Here in the United States, the police just start shooting, mm -hmm. and the the culture of fear and of militarization has got to be stopped. Yeah. And now, speaking of which, crime, when I mentioned crime, particularly um, the uh, decriminalization of, of certain drugs, whether it be marijuana, mm -hmm. et cetera, um, and as well as the, uh, the prison system and, and, how, and how that flow works, you know, public versus private prison, so in crime in general. So our position uh, on drugs is that the drug war is essentially a war on minorities, always has been. And in fact, if you go back to the Nixon era when they started it, it was explicit. They were talking about it. All those, all those things that used to be secret, those secrets are out now. We know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. It was a way of controlling leftists and blacks. Mm. That was why the, the war on drugs was created, and that's been the effect, hasn't it, especially yeah. for the black community. Um, so the war on drugs needs to be ended. Um, drug addiction is not a crime. Drug right. use is not a crime. Um, you know, it's your body, and uh, uh, the, the correct way to handle drug abuse and drugs in society is the way that, for example, Portugal has done it mm. and many other areas in the world. You decriminalize, you treat addiction as a public health problem, and you treat it as such. And when that happens, guess what? Drug use goes down, mm. and the gangs disappear, and the whole drug cartel vanishes like mist in the morning um, because it was all created by the drug war to begin with. Yeah. Now, uh, Regarding the justice, so-called mm -hmm. justice system, In the prisons, yeah. um, you know, I always think of a young man named, uh, what's his name, Khalif Browder. I'm sure some of your listeners might know about him. He was a young man who was 16 in New York City when he was arrested and accused of stealing a backpack. Mm -hmm. They never actually had a case against him, but what happened to him was he spent three years on Rikers Island a whole lot of it in solitary confinement while the justice system just went whizzing on around him yeah. and his life was destroyed and ultimately long after he was released he committed suicide now it would be one thing if this was an exceptional tragedy but it's not mm. it's a common occurrence we have only you know if you take all the people in the world only one out of 20 is an American but if you take all the prisoners in the world one out of four is in an American prisoner jail cell we incarcerate people at a rate five times that of the civilized world. 
and it falls very disproportionately on people of color. Um, it's it's an unforgivable sin for the society to be doing this. Um, locking people up for profit, and I'm sorry to say Hillary Clinton, you know, is yeah. right in the thick of that, right? People working for her campaign, people she's worked with in her professional life, the private prison system. In a, in a just and mature society, you don't, you don't run the justice system for profit. You don't have police officers stealing from people on the highway like they've been doing all across the country. And you don't have people getting locked up to line somebody else's pockets. You mm -hmm. just don't do that. So all nonviolent offenders should be released at once. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, we, should, we should reform the justice system so that it really is a justice system and not an injustice system. Okay. How about taxes? Would you raise or lower? <laughs> So the tax system needs to be completely rehashed. Um, it used to be, if you go back to the period when uh, our economy was growing the fastest, which was in the 1950s and 1960s, it, go back to the Eisenhower administration. I, I like to do that because Eisenhower was a Republican. The top marginal tax rate was about 93%. A lot of people don't understand exactly what marginal tax rate means, but but in a in a marginal tax system, which is what we have, up to a certain amount of income, everybody pays the same taxes on that income. And then if you make more income than that, then on that amount over, you might pay a different rate of tax. And then if you make more than that, then on that amount over, you might pay a different rate of tax. So if you're in a tax bracket where you pay, say, 35%, you're not paying 35% on your whole income. You pay the same amount on your first $15,000 of income as somebody who only makes 15000 That's how a progressive tax system works, right? Marginal tax. So with that in mind, in the Eisenhower administration, the highest marginal tax rate was 93%. That meant if you were pulling in millions of dollars a year, most of that money got plowed back into society. Mm -hmm. And there's good reasons for doing that. First of all, nobody works 380 times harder than somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's not humanly possible, right? So if you're making 380 times as much money, and I chose that number because that's the average amount more that CEOs of companies in the United States make than their average employee, not their lowest paid employee, their average employee, right? 380 times more. They're not working 380 times more hours. They're not sweating 380 times more sweat, right? What are they doing? They've got a game, a system, whose rules are written in such a way that allow them to pull that much out and only allows you to pull this much out. Yeah. So in a highly progressive tax system, you say, okay, well, if you're pulling in that much more than on all that extra stuff, you're going to take and turn that around and put it back into the system that you pulled it out of so that everybody benefits. It's no surprise that in the 50s and 60s, the economy grew at a great rate. There was great employment. Um, middle class income and even lower class income rose very, very quickly. In the last 40 years, what we've seen is the rich have continued to have their incomes grow astronomically, whereas people in the so-called middle class, what we really mean by working people now, um, their income has declined in the last 40 years. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of those decades ago, what about Social Security? Um, well, we certainly support Social Security, mm -hmm. and uh, I think one of the most important things we could do right away is to reduce, is to eliminate the income cap on it. Mm -hmm. You know, you only pay Social Security tax on the first hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars of income. So, if you're pulling, you know, if you're one of these uh, brokers who's pulling in a couple million dollars a year, um, you're paying a much lower rate of tax simply because you're not paying Social Security tax. Mm -hmm on that, right? So eliminating that cap so that Social Security tax applies to all income is something that we would like to see happen right away. Um, and uh, of course, making the security system, Social Security system solvent. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it would be right now if the government hadn't taken all that money and used it for something else. Mm -hmm. People like to uh, uh, talk about Social Security as though it's an entitlement, as though it's something the government is giving you. Well, the right. fact is, those mm -hmm. of us who've worked all our lives, we paid that money. Mm -hmm. It's ours. It's not the government's. Yeah. And uh, uh, they had no business spending it. And they have no business pretending that somehow it's our fault that it can't be paid in the future. Mm -hmm. and, and now, and generally speaking, because based on your answer with the education, um, health care normally is also seen as a, you know, as a right. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as the reform that just took place, health care reform, some call Obamacare, was the Green Party on the side of Obamacare or is there other reform that you want to see? We don't support Obamacare, um, and you know it's interesting. You know who came up with the uh, kinds of reforms that are in the uh, uh, the ACA, the, what we, people call Obamacare. It was the Heritage Foundation back in the '80s. Um, that was a that was a conservative think tank, and they came up with it back then because at that time, 
um, there was some risk to the insurance industry that a single-payer program might actually get enacted. And so they got together and said, well, what can we come up with that looks as good but still leaves corporations in charge of the health care system? And they came up with what we now call Obamacare. Obamacare put a new tax on workers and on small businesses in order to ensure that the big insurance companies and big pharma kept control of the health care system. So we still have tens of pe- millions of people who are not insured. We have people who have a choice of either paying hundreds of dollars out of pocket or doing without health insurance altogether um, who can't afford to do so. Personal friends of mine who have to go without health care under Obamacare. Um, it was not something that should have happened without a single-payer option, and the single-payer option was something he abandoned. So, so the Green the, Party's approach is very simple. Mm-hmm. Medicare for all. Why shouldn't you have the same opportunities for your health insurance that the congressman you elected to Congress does? Right, right, right. Yeah. So, um, so, so you guys don't agree with the, with the point of that if, if you open the market up, then, then that gives you more options with the, with the Affordable Care Act. Health Care Act. The difficulty is that you're still skimming off the top about $400 billion a year to enrich insurance companies. So there have been some necessary reforms with Obamacare. You know, it's not all bad. You know, a lot of people who couldn't get insurance now can. A lot of people who couldn't get insurance because of pre-existing conditions now can. So there are some improvements. But, you know, it's kind of like the minimum you could do when what we need is health care as a human right. Uh, you know, we're all part of the society. Nobody's life should be ruined because they suddenly got appendicitis. You know, my son was in college, and all of a sudden he got an inflamed appendix and had to be rushed off by his girlfriend to the emergency room. If it, that hadn't happened, he would have died. Um, we happen to have good health insurance. My wife works for the state of Virginia, and he was on it. Otherwise, it would have been $15,000 out of pocket. Now, what does that do to a working person who doesn't have health insurance? I mean, that wrecks everything for you. Yeah. And that's, that's not like something you have a choice about. You can't have a choice not to get your appendix out if it's going to kill you. That's not right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and we're still faced with that under Obamacare. Yeah. Okay. I know the time is winding down, so I'm going to throw a couple of things at you, and you can answer how you see fit. Sure. Um, first topic is immigrants. Um, you know, you hear all types of things about mm-hmm. building walls and mm-hmm. different things like that. Uh, the next is terrorist. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then the third, I'd say, is probably your stance on war. Okay. So with respect to immigration, you know, we, apparently we have a lot of magical immigrants um, because we have immigrants who simultaneously take Americans' jobs and, uh, and live off of welfare, which is pretty interesting when you think about it. Um, most of the illegal immigration that we're seeing now both in Europe and here in the Western Hemisphere, is created by the destruction of what used to be fully functional societies in the Global South. So in Europe, you're looking at at Syria, uh, which was hit first by a terrible 10-year drought that destroyed their agricultural system and drove families uh, off the land and into the cities, and then an engineered civil war in an effort to try to extend Western hegemony over Syria and get rid of Assad. Now, whatever you may think of Assad, that was what created it. So this is an immigration uh, situation that was created by the Western powers. And we have exactly the same thing here. You know, Hillary Clinton oversaw a violent coup in Honduras a few years ago that has created a huge part of the immigration problem. And we had no business destroying their government, but we colluded in doing so for our own selfish reasons. And now we want to say to the people whose lives have been destroyed, well, we're not going to do anything for you. We know that you can't live where you were living because we've wrecked that, and we know that you're subject to violence and and you're starving, but we're not going to let you in because it's not our problem. Mm. You know, this is not okay. Um, Immigrants have always been a net plus for the United States. They've increased the economy. Our immigrants are usually our hardest workers. Uh, They're our most dedicated citizens. Um, They know what good fortune they have in coming to the United States. And um, culturally, economically, in every sense, they've been uh, something that has contributed to making the United States a great country. Uh, And uh, so as far as illegal immigrants go, if we stop creating the problem that produces illegal immigrants, that's a problem that will largely solve itself. Now, let me get to uh, the second one you mentioned was... Terrorists, right. There again, you know, that's a, that's a problem that we made for ourselves. Um, you know, look at the greatest terrorist of all time, supposedly Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden was a creation of the CIA. During the Reagan years, he was armed and trained in order to fight the Russians in Afghanistan as part of the continuing battle over who's going to have hegemony over Southwest Asia because they got all the oil, right? Where do we get to build the pipelines? So 
Um, the Western powers, starting with Europe and then uh, in the second half of the 20th century after World War II, led by the United States, we have been all over Southwest Asia destroying their countries, bombing their people, and disrupting their societies so that we have access to their resources, which somehow we think belong to us. And the result has been the inevitable backlash. I mean, what would happen if people did that to us? I mean, Americans are pretty pretty crusty people. We would start getting pretty uh, uh, riled up, wouldn't we? And we would do things to hurt them. If we stop droning wedding parties and we stop overthrowing um, democratically elected governments as we did in Iran and Iraq and elsewhere in Southwest Asia, and if we stop propping up brutal dictators, we'll stop creating terrorists. And uh, in the meantime, of course, we have to keep our people safe. I don't mean that we don't. We have to be very vigilant. But uh, when we stop creating terrorists, that problem will in time solve itself. Yeah. Yeah. And if I may in, in, interject, it takes one to to know one. If we stop being terrorists, mm -hmm. then maybe we'll stop creating terrorists. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just had to yeah. throw that in. I understand. <laughs> uh, with respect to war, uh, of course, I've already talked about American militarism. Um, it's, uh, you know, we have been a uh, a, a a warrior country since the beginning. You know, we've we've been involved in some kind of uh, battle from the very start of our country, of course, with the revolution, but then with the Indian Wars, where we essentially wiped out the native inhabitants of this continent over the course of a hundred years, and then we started off in the late 19th century with our own version of colonialism and took the Philippines and took uh, uh, other places in the world, Cuba and so on. Um, and then throughout the 20th century, the ongoing effort to become what we are today, which is the world's hegemonic power, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, that's all a story of militarism. And uh, it's not doing us any good. And it's certainly not doing the world any good. And there are alternatives. It's not as though the world would be a less peaceful place if we stopped flooding it with weapons and stopped bombing people. Mm -hmm. It would be a more peaceful place and, uh, and a more stable place. Mm -hmm. So it's time for us to really take that to heart. Yeah. So, so lastly, I, I did want to get your your um your your input on on business in general because mm -hmm. I was thinking you know the technology sector as well as mm -hmm. I heard you mention the energy part, mm -hmm. but just but um but but just as far as homeland versus uh versus imports, just where the party stands, you know, as as far as uh, as building more more factories here instead of outsourcing. I see. Okay. Yes. Um. Well. Uh, Corporations need to be held accountable to the communities they serve and the communities they use. So let me just pick one example out of 100. Let's talk about Apple Computer. Um, Apple Computer sells billions of dollars worth of stuff to Americans and to everyone else all around the world. And to do that, they utilize the cheapest possible labor in some of the most harsh parts of the world. Yeah. Um, if Apple Computer were required to conduct business in a way that actually promoted the well-being not just of its customers, but of the people it uh, uses for labor, then that's a problem that would go away. We wouldn't have to worry about outsourcing of jobs, would we? Because uh, there wouldn't be finding ways to exploit labor in a way that destroys our economy. Um, so a large part of the economic vision that the Green Party has is when you have workers invested with ownership, and when you have workplace democracy that includes not just the workers and the managers and, and the owners, but also includes all of the people who are affected, the communities in which those uh, companies uh, do their work, and uh, the, the customers and the countries uh, that are involved in the distribution and sale of those goods. Um, and in addition, another thing the Green Party talks about is true cost pricing. You know, when you buy an iPhone, you're not paying the true cost of that. Um, you're paying a much lower cost than what it really costs because you're not paying for the economic degradation and you're not paying for the social degradation in the countries where people are underpaid to produce it. So if we require true cost pricing, that is to say if we factor into the price of goods the ecological and human costs of those goods, that's going to have a radical transformative effect as well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you've been hearing our conversations with uh, with Mr. Sidney Smith of uh, the Virginia Green Party, and he is as well a, a, a delegate for the Green Party uh, for Virginia. And um, so, Mr. Smith, thank you again. Let and me uh, let me just mention for people who want to know more, please go to gp.org for the National Green Party of the United States to jill2016.com to yes. learn more about our presidential candidate, Jill Stein. And if you live here in Virginia, please think about getting involved. You can go to vagreenparty.org, which is our state website. There's an opportunity there for you to sign up. 
Um, the Green Party is not a top-down party, it's a bottom-up party. Remember, grassroots democracy mm-hmm. is one of our four pillars. And so the Green Party of the United States is really a federation of state parties and identity caucuses, including Black Caucus, Latinx Caucus, uh, Youth Caucus. And the state parties themselves are federations of their local parties, people involved in their local communities um, and doing things like running for school board. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, uh, please find out more and think about getting involved in your local because that's how we build the party and that's how we build our future. Good, good. Mr. Smith, thank you. And um, hopefully we can chat with you again soon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. All right, thanks for joining in my humble opinion.